appointed to the staff of St. Columbus. He was given, privately, by one of his senior colleagues, three weeks to last in the job. It's now more than 50 years since, in 1941, Norman Lush came as a 19-year-old to St. Columbus, and he still has a very close association with the college in his retirement, and has recently been appointed Registrar of the Old Columban Society. Norman Lush, how come you were so young when you came to the college first, 19. Well, I had just left school at Newtown and uh, uh, I wanted to go to Trinity and my parents said, yes, that's all right, you can go to Trinity uh, if you do divinity and become a clergyman. And I said, oh no, 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 I couldn't do that. And they said, well, I'm terribly sorry then, there is no money for you to go to Trinity in that case. And uh, great pressure was put on me, especially by my elder brother and my parents, uh, to go to Trinity and to be a clergyman. My mother had been very influenced by a photograph she saw in an English paper of Dean Matthews, the, the Dean of St. Paul's, and she thought that I looked so like him that I should become a clergyman. And I said, no, I won't do that. I will paddle my own canoe. So I asked my brother Harry to get me perhaps a junior teaching job, helping with games in some school in Dublin, and uh, I would put myself through Trinity. I then had to teach myself Latin in a very short space of time to do Trinity entrance, as it was called, because Latin was not taught as a subject in uh, Newtown School in Waterford. So I got a job here, and in January, I think it was January the 8th, 1941, I came here with my brother Harry. And was it difficult just being a year older than the most senior boys? Uh, not really, not really. The, the, the prefects were, were very kind to me, they were very good to me. Uh, my brother Harry had uh, great popularity in the college. How much older than you was he? Oh, he was about 10 years. And how long had he been on the staff at that uh, time? Three years. Yes. And he was a very successful teacher of Irish and very good at games. And so Big Brother sort of kept an eye on me and the, the prefects and the pupils were, were really very kind to me. Uh, there were some, there were I think three boys, allegedly older than me. One boy, Kildare Dobbs, told me that he was three weeks older than me because I'd given him a hundred lines. And he came to the master's common room, which was then forbidden, knocked on the door and asked for Mr. Lush, and I came out. And uh, he said, my hundred lines, sir. And he said, by the way, uh, when is your birthday, sir? And I said, August 21st, same day as May West. And uh, he said, in that case, sir, I am three weeks older than you. No offence. Thank you, sir. And off he went. Did they try and take advantage ever of your youth? No, 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 indeed they didn't. In fact, uh, two boys, uh, one that was called Jesus Christ Stewart, because his initials were J.C. Stewart, and the other was called Luke McKeever, a very nice chap. They took me for a walk up the Deer Park once and trying to tell me that I should not go on with teaching, that I should get out of it and I should be, I remember, a quantity surveyor. Why did they think this? Pant. They said so. You, well, to put it honestly, what they said was, look, you're far too good for this sort of life, for heaven's sake, get out of it. Look, asked, at some of yes. the, look at some of the people that you're going to grow up with. You will end up like Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, and, -so, and uh, skip it. Well, talk about Mr. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so. You needn't name them if you like, but you said the pupils were kind to you. What, were, what about the other members of staff? Oh, they were, yes, they, they were very friendly, very friendly indeed. Uh, about a week after I came here, there was a rather heavy fall of snow, and I 
spent my first term in the room that is now, I think, the sixth form common room down by the printing chapel. That's right, the Gwyn common room. The Gwyn common room. That was my bedroom when I came for the first term. And uh, I woke up one morning to find the windows, which opened inwards, had blown in during the night. And my bed was covered with snow. <laughs> and uh, a few days later, I had a, well, a very bad cold or flu. And one of the masters, whom I didn't know, Peter Morris, who was later on killed bombing Turin in about 1942 or 43, he came along to see me in bed, armed with a, a whiskey bottle, well, a bottle with whiskey in it, and uh, some sugar, a lemon, uh, an electric kettle and a mug and a spoon, and he made me a very large hot toddy, and he had some aspirin. This was at night, and he said, now take three of those, drink that hot toddy, and here is a measure of whiskey, he said, which you take in the morning, and you take it neat. He said, you just knock it back, and you'll be okay. Now, I had never spoken to that man, uh, Peter Morris, and uh, he looked after me like that. And of course, I was up next morning and into class, because in those days, uh, you did not miss class. You did not miss a period. You did not take a half day. You did not go off to see a rugby match in England. Because if you did, some senior members of the staff would say, oh, well, it's very well for these people who can take days off and leave their classes. How many staff were there at that time? Oh, about 18, I would say. 18. Most of them resident? A great number of yes. them resident, yes. Dinner in the common room uh, at night, there would be about <coughs> maybe 14 present at dinner in the common room. And it was convivial place to be? It was very, very pleasant, yes. Dinner was a, a great education. Uh, it was uh, all set out most beautifully with the college silver. Flood the butler in full dress and there was a little dumpy maid called Margaret. They looked after us. There was a bell near the door in the common room and you pressed it three times if you, or Dr. Willis, the subordinate, uh, pressed it three <coughs> times if anything was needed. And there was a distinct pecking order at uh, dinner in common room. Nobody ever sat in the subordinate's chair except the subordinate, Dr. Willis. And on his right was White, on his left was George Lodge, then old Jack Lewis, then the chaplain, then Miller. And so it came down the table to the junior members of staff, like myself. I sat at the very bottom. And uh, you were not allowed. I was ticked off by Willis once for calling somebody by his Christian name. He came down to me and said, by the way, Lash, we do not use Christian names in here. What did you think of that? I thought it very odd. I thought it very strange, having come from the school where it was all Christian names. And, uh, well, I got used to it very quickly. And another thing you could not do is you could not, should not ask any other member of staff to pass you the salt or the gravy. You got up and you walked down the table and you took it brought it back to your place, and then left it there. But there was to be no pass. But the conversation was, was quite brilliant. Uh, at the end of the table, the rest of us did not talk, or very little. Anyway, it was Willis, White, Lodge. Do you, when you come to the common room now, when you drop in, do you welcome the more informal tone, as indeed it would have been in your time here, the more ah, yes. informal way? Yes, well, common room, of course, was very different. There was a huge fire. There was a great box to the right of the fire with logs in it. And then the walls had shelves up to about uh, 18 inches or two feet from the ceiling. And the whole common room was lined with most wonderful books, leather-bound books. And it was a most impressive room. And uh, there on Sunday morning, after breakfast at high table, any visitor to the, co to the college uh, came into common room and we sat around the fire. As long as it wasn't a woman? Oh no, women weren't allowed in. And we met these distinguished people like bishops and deans from England. And, no, women were not allowed in. And, and if such a distinguished visitor had a, a wife with them, what, what would happen? They'd oh, Mrs. Sobey would look after her. 
yes. she would uh, go upstairs and uh, do something, but uh, she wouldn't come into the common room. I mean, Mrs. Sobe used to put her head sometimes round the door of common room looking for her husband, the warden, Warden Sobe, and Willis would rush and say, oh yes, yes, can I help you? And putting his foot firmly against the door so that she couldn't come in. You mentioned Warden Sobe, who is, I suppose, in the history of the college, a controversial figure in that very differing views have been expressed about him by different people. What was your view of him? Well, to me, he was a very pleasant, a very reasonable man, very enthusiastic uh, about the college, liked everything uh, to go well. He was always out for the success of the college, that the best image should always uh, be there. Uh, and I found him uh, a pleasant man, except, uh, well, on one occasion he he liked having unusual, one or two unusual people on the staff, and so he went to a headmaster's conference in London, and he met a man over there called uh, Francis Evelyn, a clergyman, a retired clergyman, and so he invited him to come to uh, teach at the college and be assistant chaplain. And so he, when Warden Sobey came back, he had me into the study, and he told me about this. He said, I met this charming man, Evelyn, and he's coming to join the staff next term. And uh, uh, he said, uh, of course, I shall have to find him something to do. And uh, I propose to uh, give him half of your timetable. And of course, that will give you more time to work for Trinity. And of course, since he will be doing half your work, uh, he will get half your salary. You will lose half your salary. Well, that meant I had 60 pounds a year then uh, to pay my fees in Trinity and to keep body and soul together. So I was a little bit worried about this and uh, I told this to G.K. White uh, who uh, uh, looked at me and said uh, please don't think I'm, I'm not interested uh, in, in your plight. I, I, I'm just concerned uh, to what depths um, that man can sink. Referring to the warden? Yes. And, and he's going to do this to you. And he, he said, we shall see. And, and he, he um, went to his cupboard and took out a cane and put a cushion on the seat of, of his chair down in this room where Mr. Fettles now lives. And, and he beat the cushion with the, with the cane very, very severely, uh, knocking a great deal of dust out of the cushion. And then, having beaten up the cushion, he got his gown and he rushed up to the warden's study. And he came back about 10 minutes later and said to me, it's all right, your timetable is not going to be halved. And your salary would not be halved either. And why, I mean, Mr. White would seem to have thought it was ignorance or malice on the part of, of the warden. What did you think it was? I thought that I was uh, just uh, an easy target to, to let this Francis Evelyn in and Warden had to find uh, some way of giving him work to do. So. And you said that he liked having unusual characters on the staff. Yes. For the sake of it or why? Yes, he thought, I think, that it added a little bit of uh, colour to the place. And did it? Uh, Yes, it did. Yes, Evelyn. Evelyn was an extraordinary. He did come. He did, oh yes, he came. He was yeah. most, he was an extraordinary bird. Uh, he was a shy, retiring uh, waif of a of a man, and uh, he had been round a lot of the British embassies around the world as their chaplain, and uh, to Italy, France, and uh, uh, further afield. And uh, he came here, and his great interest was to learn Irish. He preached extraordinarily well in chapel. I mean, his sermons were, were very, very good. And uh, he helped to produce plays. And uh, he did one extraordinary thing. Uh, one of the years, he, he was only here for about three years. 
he, he put up a list in Founders of the various crises that had taken place the previous term and this term, and he labelled them uh, major, minor and minimus, the, uh, the crises. What and sort he, of crises would, be, would these have been? Oh, uh, uh, maybe people going out at night, or uh, people smoking, or people found uh, with huts up the Deer Park or beyond. And uh, he had notes at the foot of this great chart uh, in Founders in Latin. And uh, this remained there for about a week. I thought that uh, some of the senior staff uh, might have taken it down and removed it, but it was there. It was a great topic of conversation. And what was it designed to show? Uh, I don't, it was a very odd thing for him to do. Was it because he, was this an indication that you were in a sense living from one crisis to another at that time? I think it was. And yes. did you feel that? Uh, I did, yes, yes. There, there were a lot of. Uh, and what was this scenes. because discipline was lax or because of uh, the wardens perhaps uh, overreacting to? Events? No, no, I think a certain exuberance on the part of uh, senior boys. You, know, you get this from time to time where you get a certain type of boy who gets uh, perhaps a little tired of being confined uh, to the college hmm. and uh, there's a rash of crises and then it all subsides after a year or so when, when a certain group will leave or maybe get more sense. You mentioned uh, the chaplain at the time, Lynn Miller. Oh, yes. Um, he was an unusual character now, wasn't he? I remember you talked to me about him yes. before. Yes, 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 he, he was. Uh, I did, did not see him for my, my first term in the college. He appeared at the very end of term because he was not very well, and so he... Um, he didn't come to take class and he didn't take chapel. And he, he lived up in his room and his food was sent up from the kitchen. And uh, uh, Mrs. Sobey did do some teaching for him. Uh, and uh, he was doing the Diploma of Education, I think, too, in Trinity. And he would go into his lectures in Trinity and come back but couldn't teach, couldn't take his classes. And then he used to take some boys in the evening up in his room for extra tuition in English or maybe history, but certainly English. And then he would charge them uh, for this. And uh, I remember a furious row taking place in convention uh, between George White and this man, Lynn Miller, and uh, about White attacked Miller for uh, charging pupils for extra classes and he wasn't turning up uh, to teach them. Well, how could the warden of the time permit this to happen? Uh, yes, that, that is a difficult question to answer. Uh, uh, he, he didn't like interfering too much with uh, uh, Lynn Miller. He is still alive, I think, Lynn Miller. He is in, in Kent, I think. He must be 92 or 93, but I know Adrian Summerfield had a letter from, from him about a year ago. And uh, he couldn't, Sobe really couldn't very well get rid of him because uh, Miller uh, could not leave the, jurisdic the jurisdiction of uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, because he, uh, well, he had debts, I think, in England, and he had debts in the north of Ireland. So therefore, he was confined to the Republic of Ireland. I see. He preached most wonderful sermons. Uh, a very lot of fiery. A lot of these. Now that you mentioned fiery sermons, a lot of the colleagues that you've referred to, um, and the time that you referred to in the college's history, was written about in in the novel *Lord Dismiss Us*. Now, did you feel that that novel? was an accurate portrayal of the atmosphere and indeed perhaps the characters in the college at the time? 
Oh, yes. Yes, I do, indeed. I knew Campbell. I mean, I taught Campbell. He was a, the, the writer of Lord Dismissus. Uh, he was a very fine hockey player and a lovely bat at cricket. And, of course, he lived up in, in Rockbrook, uh, the son of Lord Glenavy. And I think it was uh, uh, most accurate. Uh, Incidentally, when I was teaching out in, in, in South Africa in 1968 and 69, uh, at a cocktail party one evening, I met a bloke, uh, a businessman who had just returned from uh, the UK, and I was chatting to him, and he discovered that I was teaching. And he told me about this wonderful book uh, that had uh, come out uh, in England, and if uh, I could lay hands on it, it would, be, it would be well worth reading. So I asked him what the name of it, and he said, oh, uh, Lord Dismissus. And he said uh, to me, i let you in on a secret, but for heaven's sake, don't tell anybody. It's about a school called Stowe. <laughs> and I said, ah, oh, how interesting, because I had heard about the book, and uh, knew all about it, but it was believed in England that it was stone. How did colleagues here react when the book came out? A number of whom would have featured in it under another name. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, some, uh, some people were very angry, very uh, hurt and annoyed at the way Campbell dealt with uh, Peter Ault. And, and Peter Ault uh, really did a great, great deal for Campbell and went to a lot of trouble uh, to help him with his English and uh, was quite a great friend of his. And uh, for Campbell to uh, uh, portray Alt as he did, particularly near the end, and how he yes. died was, was very unkind because at the time uh, Alt's mother uh, was alive in Greystones and his Alt's brother Billy Ault, uh, was a surgeon in the Royal Navy. And it was very unfeeling of Campbell to, to do that. But uh, people were annoyed. I know Eve White was very annoyed that she was portrayed as a barmaid in the Yellow House, uh, for example. That didn't go down awfully well. Uh, and uh, Your brother featured in it too. Yes, he was He was called Jimmy Rich. That's right. Yes, yes. Yes, he... he uh, looked upon it as uh, only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about or written about. He didn't mind. He was Good. I'd like to move on, Norman, um, to the next wardenship, because you were away in Malvern in England between 1944 and 1954, and you then returned to the college where there was a new warden, Martin Argyle. Yes. What changes had you seen when you came back? Oh, well, now, the, the, the place was uh, much more relaxed. Uh, the, uh, it was, in a way, uh, more low-key. Uh, things moved along very quietly and pleasantly. Uh, there were no crises, well, at least very few of them. There were always now and again crises happened in schools, but uh, there, were, there were very few crises, and, and Warden Argyle, I think, would have had uh, uh, some advice, maybe, from the fellows when he came, uh, that he should uh, not continue in the same vein as Warden Sobey did, over having, say, uh, members of the, the government up in the college. I think it was advised to cut out that connection and, or play it down because Warden Sobey had uh, De Valera up on two or three occasions. Uh, James Dillon, who was Minister for Agriculture, was a wonderful uh, speaker. He, I heard him speak a couple of times lecture in the big schoolroom and he had uh, uh, Alfie Byrne uh, up here and uh, why, why do you think this was um, looked down upon or thought to be unwise? I think some of the fellows who uh, at the time 
uh, just thought that uh, Warden Sobey might have gone a bit too far with the with government connection in this country, that it might have hurt some of the people who uh, maybe looked uh, to the other island a bit. Did you feel that, that the college at that time was a place that looked to the other island? No, no, I thought uh, that uh, Warden Sobey had a, a, had a very good balance. Uh, he, had, he had people uh, in the college from, uh, from Ireland, Roland Lestrange, Bryce, and, uh, De Valere and Dillon, as I said, and then he had a lot of people over from England. I mean, in one term, we had three or four deans, so that uh, Soby was referred to in the, in the RCB, anyway, in St. Stephen's Green, where it then was, as Cedric the Dean Stalker. I mean, he had Dean Matthews and Paul de la Billiere and Dean Costley White from Gloucester over, and uh, all in one term. And he had Dean Matthews. Yes, I think Dean Matthews uh, stayed here for a long weekend, for nearly a week. And he had uh, went out to dinner uh, one night with De Valera. And uh, I, because I was asked by Warden Sobey if I would, if I was working, would I stay up in the common room and let uh, Dean Matthews from St. Paul's in and see him up the stairs and then lock up because I was living in this house. And uh, Dean Matthews returned about uh, 12 o'clock, having obviously had a very good dinner uh, with De Valera. And I think he, part of his, the reason for his visit to Ireland was to try to persuade De Valera to do something about allowing the British Navy to use the ports. And certainly it was rather sad meeting with Dean Matthews because I had to give him a telegram. Uh, and uh, he opened the telegram just as he was going up the stairs. And when he came to the landing, he stopped and read it. And it was just to tell him that his, uh, his son had been drowned. His ship had been uh, torpedoed in the Atlantic. And so it was a yes. sad occasion. Getting back to um, Warden Argyle, in, when you came back to the college, I'm interested in this idea that, that in a sense there weren't so many outsiders coming in, perhaps it's in Toby's time. What was, would the composition of the college have been like in terms of the boys? I mean, were, there, were they mainly from uh, Ireland? Were they mainly from the, the, uh, the uh, Republic, um, as it then was, or, or were there many from England? What, what, what was the composition, and was it exclusively Protestant and white? Uh, there were some boys, uh, there were some boys from England, yes, not many uh, from abroad, very few from abroad, outside uh, the British Isles, that geographical misnomer. Uh, and uh, there were a great, a good number from the north of Ireland, it would have been about 2025 uh, from the north and they they were largely from the island of Ireland and no they weren't all they were not all white there were some uh, uh, from Africa and some from uh, Southeast Asia Singapore Malaysia and was it, was it all Protestant at that time? I really don't, I really don't know. That, that, never, that never came up, I think, uh, until much later uh, in, in, in the life of the college. It, it, it came up now and again. And, yes. Uh, uh, I remember one boy uh, some years ago maybe about 15, 20 years ago, boasting that they uh, were 36% of the, the people, the pupils in the college were Roman Catholics. And he said, we'll soon make it 40.
percent, and then we can ask for our own chaplain. Uh, you might remember that, maybe. <laughs> Are you suggesting I put him up to it? No, no, oh, no, 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 no. You would never do a thing like that. You are much too diplomatic. <laughs> Now, the year after you came back, you became a housemaster of Stack Allen, and yes. that lasted 25 years. That's right, yes. What were your, what were the greatest pleasures and the biggest pains about being a housemaster? Oh, uh, the greatest pleasures were, well, I am, I've always been interested in, in people. I like dealing with people. I like helping people. And I like being involved up to the Hilton, wh wherever I am. And being a housemaster and going to housemasters' meetings, etc., meeting parents and helping boys with, in Stag Allen with uh, careers, encouraging them at games, dealing with their problems, uh, was a. Well, it gave me a lot of pleasure. And of course, in those days when I became a housemaster in 1955, housemaster of Stack Allen. Stack Allen was divided into four. Uh, we had uh, a dormitory, the lower dormitory belonged to Stack Allen. Then we were down in Orpen. Um, I had boys down in the rectory where, where Canon Handy uh, was the rector of White Church and four or five boys cycled down there at night. And uh, I had, uh, I think for a time, I had a, a dormitory in the garden house. And uh, when Dr. Willis retired, I put in a plea uh, to um, Warden Argyle, uh, saying that Gaul was divided into three parts. I said, Stack Island is divided into four parts. Uh, would there be any chance of Stack Allen, even just for a year, being under one roof, and could we move into the Cadogan? And that Glenn then might move out as it would be getting a new housemaster. And I had been for some years uh, looking after Stack Allen in three or four different places, and Warden our guide was very good about that, and he said, uh, I'll see what I can do. And so we did get over to the Cadog. And uh, in those days, a housemaster would, uh, did, looked after his house, uh, I, I would say, as it were, completely. Uh, Warden Soby used to look after exits when he was warden. Housemasters didn't give exits. They looked after pocket money and caning and that sort of thing. Uh, thing, but Warden Sobey would give a boy uh, exits and would, uh, particularly the Sunday exits. And uh, that was one of the big changes when uh, Warden Argyle came that uh, housemasters were housemasters. The school, as it were, was divided into four separate units, and each housemaster was in charge and had a considerable control and only went to see Warden Argyle if there was some big problem or sent a boy to him for some major. Yes. Uh, you mentioned caning there. What, what do you think now, looking back on it, of corporal punishment? Um, do you approve of the its abolition? Oh Not yes. here, but just nationally. Oh yes, oh yes. I, I um, At Newtown School, it was a Quaker school, and nobody was ever caned there. Uh, and, and when I came here, I found uh, this caning, uh, I didn't like it. And uh, particularly uh, caning by prefects. I thought that was uh, very, very wrong. Was it abused? Because some of the prefects were quite savage mm -hmm. uh, in their caning. They had to get housemaster's permission. They had to go along to the housemaster and say, Sir, X has been fooling in dormitory again, and this is the third time, and I have uh, tried to stop him doing this and have reported him to you. Please, may I cane him? And the housemaster would say, yes, give him three, or give him four. I mean, in those days, you would get three uh, for running in the warden's garden, three strokes. And I just 
thought that was uh, altogether wrong. And I did cane in Stack Allen. But, and it, it really was terrible to see a poor frightened boy with his arms, hands down in the seat of a chair, and you would give him two or three strokes of the cane. I gave them very lightly. And then uh, I decided I had enough of this. And at housemaster's meeting, uh, once I brought it up that caning by prefects should be done away with. Mm. And we argued about it and uh, discussed it. And eventually it was <coughs> passed that, uh, as from next term, prefects would not cane. Did the, did the prefects themselves that were incoming that following term resent the fact that this power had been taken from them? Some of them did. Uh, a few did. Uh, a great number of them uh, were delighted mm. with it. They, they didn't. Of course, only the, um, the college prefects could cane the head of house. It wasn't. But those who were coming up uh, as uh, house prefects saw their chance that they would be able to cane later on. But uh, that was done away with, and it very soon was forgotten about. Well, another very big change, perhaps an even bigger change, that took place in your time here was uh, the introduction of girls, and during Warden Gibbs's time, the college becoming fully co-educational in that we had girls all the way through the college. Had you any reservations about the, the principal, first of all? Oh no, oh no, oh no, that whole thing, the introduction of girls was really, uh, uh, you would have enjoyed it all. Uh, it was a very fine bit of engineering because uh, uh, I collected a few members, members of staff uh, round about me and we had meetings to discuss uh, the future of the college and we drew up a memorandum round about 1968 or 69 I think it was 69 um, and um, as to what changes should be brought about in the college and the college should be uh, dragged into the 20th century before it was too late and um, uh, I discussed this memorandum with uh, Bursar Derek Holmes and said that uh, I would like it uh, to be uh, introduced to some of the fellows, and he, I showed him. Did, did the warden, the then warden, know that this no. was happening? No, he didn't. Was there a reason for that? Do you think uh, he wouldn't have been receptive? He mightn't have been. We just thought for a, a moment that, at, at the time, that it should be kept just amongst ourselves. And uh, Derek Holmes uh, thought it a, a very good idea, and he got uh, three... Uh, three fellows interested in this memorandum and its ideas and the, the ideas were that there should be girls uh, introduced into the college and that there should be a junior house and that there should be more day boys and that there should be a science block built because science was uh, rather confined to very small out of date laboratories and that there should be an appeal and, and uh, uh, three fellows were very interested in this, and then we took it to Warden Argyle. I took it to him and, and showed it to him, and he thought, "Oh yes, yes, very good. This, I believe, is 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 um, yes, yes. Not everybody," he said, "will agree with it." And uh, it came up at fellows' meetings, and uh, he showed it. No, before it came up at fellows' meetings, uh, Warden Argyle showed the memorandum uh, to George White, who was then sub warden. Who was then sub warden and a fellow. Yes. He was sub-warden and a fellow, and, and uh, the, the uh, memorandum greatly upset George White. Uh, he thought it uh, very foolish. He wrote to me and said that he was deeply depressed by the whole thing, that some of his colleagues, whom he had great respect for, had actually signed this. And uh, he then uh, remarked to me, he said, if this goes through, I shall never, never forgive you uh, for it. And it went through. And did he forgive you? I think so. I think he did. I think he did. He, he didn't like change. No. And uh, he liked the college as it was, uh, uh, single sex. And uh, 
I think eventually he approved. Yes, he, there were a lot of things that he, resist, he resisted. Uh, and uh, then came round to later on think of them all right. And um, you became sub-warden in 1973 in succession to, to George White. And you were sub-warden for a year and the, under Warden Argyle. And then for the rest of your time uh, under David Gibbs. What were the, if you could say, the contrasting features or the main features of each wardenship, or how would you, can, can you characterise the way in which the three wardens you served worked as far as you saw them? Yes, I think, uh, I think Warden, uh, Warden Argyle, when I became sub warden, he, he said to me, Well, that's great. Uh, you have accepted being subordinate. The only bit of advice I give you is uh, remember now that what you say will have greater weight uh, next term than what it has this term, as you would be subordinate. So that was all the, the guidance he gave me, uh, as it were. And he said, I look forward greatly to working with you for, four, for the next four years. And uh, he actually then, during that year, uh, decided that he was going to leave and uh, he gave his notice uh, in to the fellows. I don't think it was because I was subordinate that he decided to leave. Uh, I hope not. Uh, uh, but uh, the difference between the Warden Argyle's regime and uh, Warden Gibbs who succeeded him, I think Warden Argyle was becoming uh, very set in his ways in his last four or five years. And uh, George White had been his subordinate. And I think they were both rather tired. And, and uh, when Warden Gibbs came, he realized that a great deal had to be done to uh, freshen the place up a bit and to get a bit. Uh, he was a great man for uh, order and for things being done correctly. And um, I got a subwarden, I got guidelines for subwarden. And then the housemasters, there were guidelines for housemasters and guidelines for matron and guidelines for housekeeper. Uh, and uh, the whole uh, place was much more orderly and there was great buzz uh, about it. Uh, he, uh, he was, very enthusiastic and he got things moving, uh, such as music. He did a great deal for music. He introduced the um, Columban Award scheme and uh, uh, made a number of changes like that. There were great building changes too, which happened in each ward yes. at the time. What were, what were the main difficulties you found about being subordinate? Well, it depended on, on how much you wanted to put into it. I, of course, loved being involved and, and, and uh, um, having, to, having to run things. And it, it, was, it was largely time. <clears throat> I was a housemaster running the cricket, teaching about 26 periods a week and being subordinate. And uh, uh, one of the, looking back on it, one of the the things now that I really missed and my family remind me about it from time to time they used to say oh, of course dad you were never at home you were always up in the college and I did miss uh, for three terms per year being at home with my children and seeing them as as children did you find that when you were a subordinate that your priorities had in fact changed or maybe were forced to change for example, you mentioned three areas. There's the administrative area of being subordinate, the games, cricket, obviously, and uh, your geography teaching. Did if if you were able to do it again, and of course your family, would would you yeah. put, would you have rearranged your priorities a bit, or did they get yes, askew I, a bit? I I think I think that I would not. Uh, I would have given up being a housemaster. Uh, and, and being subwarden. I think being housemaster and subwarden, it was really very, very demanding. It meant being up here 
from about a quarter to eight in the morning until 12 at night, 11 at night, uh, seven days a week. And then being involved in games uh, meant that uh, getting home for lunch or anything like that was, was just out of the question. But it was most enjoyable. What um, regrets have you, if any? Uh, about? About your life as a schoolmaster. Oh, oh, I don't think I, I have any regrets. Would you have done any things differently? Uh, I, th I think I would, yes. I think, you mean would I have done something different for a time or would I have no, done No, would you have done things that you did differently if you, if you had your time over again? I would love to have been a missionary for about five or ten years. <laughs> Instead of going to England, I'd love to have worked in Africa, so India, yes. uh, something like that. Uh, but uh, as uh, would I have done things differently in the college? Yes, I, I probably uh, might have. There's more behind that question, I think, than you know. I'm I'm no, I'm just wondering. No, <laughs> there isn't actually. No. I'm just wondering if uh, this is when no. I said regrets. Or not perhaps regrets no. was the wrong word, but maybe that you would have done things slightly differently in some areas or other. I think I wouldn't have driven myself as hard hmm. as I did. I mean, I went at everything, direct assault, and very enthusiastically, uh, and probably stepped on a great deal of corn. I mean, number horns on the way and maybe upset one or two people now and again by my enthusiasm uh, for things. And commitment. And commitment, yes. But uh, no, I was very happy here. And Your, your commitment began, as I said initially, over 50 years ago. The college was obviously very different then. But do you, what, what do you see about the college today in 1993 that is still basically the same? as it was in 1941 when you came first? Well, what has always impressed me about the college is uh, the, the way each pupil uh, can develop in his or her own way. There are no pressures put if people want to go out and uh, paint a picture or write a poem or as uh, one prefect I knew once, uh, sitting on the Hurley Gate, uh, imagining he was a nightingale and uh, singing to the clouds. Uh, Columbians can develop with, uh, with a great deal of freedom. And of course, in Sobey's, Warden Sobey's time, in Warden Sobey's time, the whole of the mountain area, and right up to Three Rock and Two Rock, was open to the college. And uh, he encouraged people to to leave the college and to go on cycle rides. You could on Sunday then uh, get a, a packed lunch and go off down the country. People have cycled down to Arklow and back in time for Evensong on Sunday in those days. And of course, there were only three exits a term for pupils in, in, in the 40s and in the, in the early 50s too. And this, the, going out almost every Sunday would have been considered very, very strange in those days. Uh, pupils were confined a great deal and had to make their own amusements and clubs and societies on a Saturday evening. It was, it was a great uh, hum of activity in, in the college on a Saturday evening. We're now in our 150th year. What do you hope we might be celebrating for the 200th? Uh, I would uh, like to see uh, the cricket pitch extended down to the road, if the road is ever built, a nice new pavilion uh, down there for cricket, and uh, cricket back as a very serious game in the summertime. On that very optimistic note, Norman, thank you very much. Yeah.